Whatever happened to typicality? Prolix in and Haldol, even Thorazine. And who's at risk for TD here? Somebody tell me, please. These old drugs confusing me. How's it going? This video is going to be on the differences between the typical and atypical antipsychotics. And this might sound especially postmodern of me, but I found that to grasp the differences, you really need to understand the history of antipsychotics. So for this series on the differences, this is going to be part one, the story of typical antipsychotics. So Sigmund Freud developed psychoanalysis in the early 1900s, and through the 1950s, psychoanalysis was really the lens that people used to view mental health disorders. So even schizophrenia, which in my opinion is the most quote-unquote biological mental illness, was conceptualized at the psychological level. The psychoanalytic interpretation was that the ego would be so overwhelmed by anxiety that the individual would regress to the early oral stage where there was no separation between ego and id. And this would kind of dissolve the barriers between the inside self and the outside world and the person really couldn't distinguish between the two. And of course, now that we know that it's really dysfunction within neurochemistry, these interpretations sound absurd. So before the 1950s, we really had no idea what was going on in schizophrenia or bipolar or catatonic depression. There weren't drug treatments for these patients, and it was very clear that therapy didn't work. So physicians resorted to pretty extreme measures to treat these patients. There were treatments like electroshock therapy and insulin coma, which I conceptualize as like a rebooting of the computer. It's like you take their brain, shake it like a snow globe, and hope it settles to a calmer disposition. And then there were treatments like simple sedation or frontal lobotomy, which of course did nothing to treat the underlying schizophrenia, but it made the patient more docile and less problematic for society. So the enormous paradigm shift from the psychoanalytic perspective on psychopathology to the present day biological focus on psychopathology really starts in the 1950s with the discovery of chlorpromazine, which is Thorazine. So even though Thorazine was discovered in the 50s, we actually have to go back to 1876 to understand how it was discovered. So in 1876, methylene blue, which is a phenothiazine, was synthesized. So in the 1880s, methylene blue was used in cell staining experiments, so it would be used to stain bacteria and parasites. And it was eventually used to stain malaria, which led to the discovery that it could be actually used to treat malaria. And if you're like me, you might be thinking how bizarre it is that they were able to discover a treatment for malaria while utilizing methylene blue in a totally unrelated way, which was the staining. But this is actually a pretty common theme in drug discovery. Two fun examples are lithium and Depakote. So lithium was only discovered because John Cade was injecting urine from manic patients into rats, and he needed a soluble form of urate to use as a control group to compare to the manic piss rats. So he used lithium urate, which is known to be the most soluble, and he noticed that the rats became tranquil. And then Depakote was only discovered because they were using it as a quote-unquote metabolically inert solvent for organic compounds. So while scientists were looking for drugs that had anti-seizure activity, they were using valproic acid to dissolve the drugs in. So again, it was just a complete accident that it worked. But back to the methylene blue. In the 1940s, chemists began making derivatives of methylene blue, and this led to promethazine. And even though it had no activity against infective organisms, they found it had good antihistamine effects. So it went to market as a drug for allergies and anesthesia. But scientists still wanted to see if they could find an even better antihistamine, so they kept making derivatives of the derivatives of the methylene blue. And in 1950, they stumble across chlorpromazine. When they give it to rats, they notice an indifference to aversive stimuli, but no one's particularly excited about it. In 1951 in Paris, they use it as an anesthetic booster on surgery patients, and notice it does a pretty good job at calming down the patient and reducing shock. Eventually, someone gets the idea to use it in psychiatric patients, and this is where things get interesting. So they use it on a manic patient and notice a dramatic change, and he's discharged after three weeks. So they do a clinical trial in 1952, and they notice that with the chlorpromazine, the patient isn't just sedated, they actually show improvements in their thinking and emotional behavior. This leads to a huge spread of Thorazine, as it's now being used to treat schizophrenia and mania and other psychotic disorders. And the term was coined neuroleptic syndrome for what the drug caused. And this translates to taking hold of one's nerve, and this is in reference to the side effects that the medication cause, which is the lethargy and impaired motor control. Also moving forward, drugs that were used to treat psychosis were called major tranquilizers, and this was in comparison to what was considered minor tranquilizers, and that would be drugs that were used to treat neurosis. Today, we don't really use these terms, we just call it an antipsychotic. So this has a huge impact on emptying psychiatric hospitals, because now there's a treatment that can be taken outside the hospital. So this is really the start of moving away from straitjackets and from lobotomies and from insulin therapy. And here we really see the field of psychopharmacology emerge. And basic scientists were able to determine that the mechanism of action of the drug was through dopamine blockade, 
and leads to the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia and raises the hopes that biological mechanisms of all mental illnesses will be discovered and really shifts psychiatry to understanding mental illness through biological constructs. But of course, Thorazine is not perfect, and people quickly notice it causes major motor problems called extrapyramidal symptoms. And the reason this occurs is because dopamine isn't only involved in psychosis. There are really four major dopaminergic pathways. The first is the mesolimbic pathway, which is sometimes referred to as the reward pathway. Problems here are what cause the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, like psychosis. Next is the mesocortical pathway, which is involved in cognition and also motivation and emotional response. Problems here are associated with the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, such as lack of motivation, lack of facial expressions, lack of interest in socializing. Next is the nigrostriatal pathway, and this is involved in voluntary movement. And problems here are what cause the extrapyramidal symptoms, or EPS. So the pyramidal tracts are kind of the main motor neurons that connect your brain to your spinal cord to your muscles and are involved in movement. So movement disorders that are outside the pyramidal tracts are called extrapyramidal side effects. And the fourth track is the tuberoinfundibular pathway. So issues here causes problems with prolactin, which is involved with female menstruation and also breast milk in women and men. So the theory that emerges from the antipsychotics is that we know it has dopamine 2 receptor blockade. So symptoms of a psychosis occur when there's dopamine overactivity in the mesolimbic pathway. The problem is we don't know a way to just block that pathway. So in order for the drug to have an antipsychotic effect, we need to block 60 to 65% of dopamine 2 receptors. The problem is that at about 80% is when you start having dysfunction in the other circuits. So if you block too much of the nigrostriatal pathway, you'll get the extrapyramidal side effects. If you block too much of the tuberoinfundibular pathway, you start to get issues with prolactin. If you block too much of the mesocortical pathway, you get the neurolepsis, which is the emotional quieting or the affective indifference. So going back to our history lesson, the big problem with Thorazine was its propensity to cause extrapyramidal side effects like akathisia, Parkinsonianism, and dystonia. The really scary one was tardive dyskinesia, which results in involuntary repetitive body movements like grimacing and sticking out your tongue and smacking your lips. It occurs in some people when they're on antipsychotics for a long time. And the reason it's scary is because if you stop the medication and start treatment, some people get resolution of symptoms, but not everyone does. So at this time, they continue to synthesize different antipsychotics. And the vast majority of them are in the phenothiazine class, aka methylene blue derivatives. And at this point, the antipsychotics are referred to as neuroleptics, but this class of medications will go on to be called typical antipsychotics and also first-generation antipsychotics. The appropriateness of these names I'll talk about later. So the majority of these new drugs are phenothiazines, but in 1958, they stumble across haloperidol. So haloperidol, or haldol, belongs to the butyrophenones, and it was synthesized in 1958 by Paul Janssen. The story here is that Jansen was working on analgesic drugs, basically painkillers. So while he was trying to develop better painkillers, he was messing around with one of the drugs that's an analog of methadone. And he noticed that when he gave one of the drugs he synthesized to a rat, they noticed that it went into a cataleptic state similar to Thorazine. So he kept tinkering with it and eventually Haldol was chosen for clinical testing. It was found to be 50 to 100 times more potent than Thorazine and had less tendency to produce some of the side effects. So it was initially tried in patients with delirium tremens, but it didn't help that much. So after a few weeks, it was used IV in a psych patient with an emotional crisis, and they saw really good results. And when they used the drug in psychiatric patients, they found that its anti-hallucination effect really surpassed the other drugs they had. And this led to the development of other butyrophenones in the 1960s. So it was found that Haldol had a significantly higher potency for the D2 receptor than Thorazine. So now they had a whole bunch of different antipsychotics, but none of them were really better than any of the other ones. So all these different drugs did have variability in their side effect profile, but the problem was they all still caused EPS. At this point, the drugs were mainly grouped by their potency. So they were high potency antipsychotics, middle potency, and low potency, and it's referring to the potency of the D2 receptor. The new drugs don't really focus on potency, so the concept can be a little confusing for people. The big takeaway though is that if it's high potency, it's really only going to hit the D2 receptor. If it's low potency, then it's going to hit other receptors like histamine receptors, adrenergic receptors, and muscarinic receptors. So examples of the main ones you still see today. For high potency, it's flufenazine or prolixin and haldol. For middle potency, it's perfenazine or trilophon. And then for low potency, it's chlorpromazine or thorazine. So with the high potency drugs, since it's mostly just hitting the D2, you're going to have more of the EPS, but less of the other side effects like the antihistamine and the anticholinergic effects. And then for the low potency, you have a bit of a less risk of EPS, but more of the other side effects. 
And the potency concept becomes a lot less abstract when you actually use the medications because the dosages line up with the potency. So for example, since Thorazine is a low potency, you're gonna have to expect a high dose for an effect. So a common dosage is like 300 milligrams per day. And then with something like Haldol, you have the opposite. So it's high potency, so you'd expect a low dose. So it's common for a patient to be taking like eight milligrams per day. Now, before I move on to the start of the quote unquote atypical antipsychotics, I'll go into a quick relevant tangent on antidepressants. So the first class that we discovered were the MAOIs. And the story here is that researchers developed isoniazide for the treatment of tuberculosis. They then developed a similar drug, imperniazide, but they noticed that when they gave it to patients, the patients would get inappropriately happy. So basically what was initially noted to be side effects of euphoria and psychostimulation and increased appetite and improved sleep eventually turned into a clinical study on depression showing significant improvements in patients' mood. And then the drug started getting used as an antidepressant in 1958. Now, as for the class of the TCAs, the first drug was imipramine. So imipramine was also synthesized as an antihistamine. So while they were looking for better antipsychotics than Thorazine, they decided to use imipramine in schizophrenic patients. So it didn't have D2 blockade, so of course it didn't work for schizophrenia, but they incidentally noticed that it helped depression. And this led for it being used for the treatment of depression in Europe in 1958 and in the United States in 1959. These drugs led to a classic paper being published in 1965 called The Catecholamine Hypothesis of Affective Disorders and led to the adoption of the monoamine hypothesis of depression and mental illness. So the next video in the series is going to go into how clozapine was discovered and how this influenced us to call all future antipsychotics atypical and second gen. Thanks for watching.